Hi everyone, my name is Kylie and I am the Community Engagement Specialist at Columbia Springs. And if you haven't been to our site before, I really encourage you to take a visit. It's just off of Evergreen Highway in Vancouver, Washington, and it's really beautiful, especially this time of year. Um, but if you haven't heard of Columbia Springs, we essentially help tens of thousands of children and their families find belonging in and love for nature. We build a community of lifelong learners and land stewards through our educational opportunities, walking trails, events, and workshops, which are open to all. I believe that there really is something for everyone at Columbia Springs, and I hope that we see you on our trails soon. And if you want to learn more, please visit our website. It's columbiasprings.org. I think I'll get on to telling you about our first expert here in the Columbia Springs Beaver Bash series. And just to give everybody a heads up, we'll be doing these every Thursday in June at 530. So please keep joining us every week. But our first speaker is Greg Gregory Llewellyn. And he is a Portland native with a master's degree from Portland State University in environmental management. And he's now working towards a PhD in geography from the University of Saskatchewan. His research focuses on how beaver dam analogs affect sediment transport rates of small mountain streams, um, particularly one located in the foothills of the Canadian Rockies. And he's also a co-author of a beaver restoration guidebook an instructor in the fisheries department at Mount Hood Community College. And this presentation is going to be about beaver ecology and the legacy of watershed management in North America. Those might seem like big things, but I promise you that Greg is going to boil it down to really low tech terms here. Um, and it was so nice to meet you all and talk to you for a minute. And if you want to put where you're um, viewing from in the chat, we'd love to hear from you too. And with that, I'll pass it over to Greg. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Kylie. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and it's always a pleasure to talk about beaver. So I, I love to have these kind of discussions. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask at the end. And I think Kylie's gonna put my email in the chat. So feel free to contact me if you want more information on anything um, or you want, would like some data from, from some beaver sites or just to continue this discussion. So today we're just going to talk about beavers and the legacy that they have started and continue to grow on the landscape here in North America, also in Eurasia, but we're going to be focusing on the North American impacts. First, I'll just talk about a little history involving beaver and the before European settlement of North America and what happened to them after the Europeans arrived. So there are two extant species of beaver on the planet, Castor canadensis in North America or the North American beaver and Castor fiber, the Eurasian beaver. In the past, beaver numbers were very high in both places. Uh, estimates range up to 400 million beavers in North America. Unfortunately, however, the population of beavers were decimated starting in the 17th century. And the numbers plummeted in both ranges. But they are now coming back and they have colonized almost the entirety of their former range in North America. And they're starting to come back in Europe and Asia as well. Current estimates are around six to 12 million beaver present on the landscape, but it's very difficult to estimate beaver population numbers. So we can't say for, for certain, but as you can see, their range is very large. And that means they are incredibly adaptable and able to colonize in all sorts of different environments and climates. As I mentioned, their numbers plummeted starting in around the 17th century. And unfortunately, it was due primarily to a fashion trend. Beaver were almost exterminated from the planet uh, because they were turned into hats. Beaver felted hats were very popular. Um, and just to kind of give you some numbers, in 1700, 
70,000 beaver hats were exported out of England. And by 1760, the number rose to around 500,000 hats exported every year out of just England. So there was a huge demand for this style of hats and they were very expensive. Um, they probably cost equivalent around $200 in today's prices. They were wonderful as felted hats because they were waterproof and they looked pretty trendy as well. So to feed this incredible demand for beaver pelts, um, first they were wiped out in Europe and when they realized that there was an incredible fur resource in North America, the Western, westward push across North America was driven um, primarily by the search for new fur resources. And beaver furs were by far the most lucrative type of fur that you could acquire. And there were a lot of beaver in almost every watershed in North America. And um, lots of many main cities that we know today, such as Astoria or Detroit, New Orleans, um, also Montreal, New York, those cities all started as fur trading posts with the main effort to locate and find new beaver pelts. So uh, North America was colonized for lots of different reasons, but a, a main driver was the search for beaver. And um, that search went very well. They, they found a lot of beaver and started wiping them out, unfortunately. As the beaver numbers plummeted on the East Coast, they moved westward. Here is a map that um, was given to uh, Lewis, from the Lewis and Clark expedition, and it shows a series of beaver ponds on the landscape. So you can see that there were lots of beaver ponds and they were major landmarks that people used to get around in their search for other resources, transportation and trade routes, and of course, beaver to trap. As the West wiping out beaver pretty soon, most of the beaver were gone except for on the West Coast. And at that time, the Louisiana Purchase had happened and the United States was thinking about acquiring the Oregon Territories. And the Northwest Trading Company in Canada and stationed in Astoria wanted that land for themselves. And so to make it less desirable to pioneers and colonists, they tried to wipe out all of the fur-bearing animals, including beaver, throughout all of Oregon, California, and really the Western states. And they were successful. They wiped out almost all the beaver all throughout the Willamette Valley. And pretty soon, well, after a couple hundred years, in about 1930, land managers and um, and um, wildlife managers looked around and realized to their horror that there was a good chance that beaver had gone extinct in North America. So to try to remedy that, they changed laws and legislation so that trapping would slow down and a lot of beavers number, beaver numbers to come back. Because not only were the beaver gone, and that fur resource was gone, but they started to notice that without beaver, the rivers were changing shape and they were functioning differently. Be uh, rivers started to turn from multi-threaded systems into single-threaded rivers, and they became much more, uh, they were drier and vegetation was dying. So we were losing wetlands and we were losing biodiversity. When a river loses its beaver dams, the water that normally be pushed out towards the valley walls now is only in that single river channel. And all of this riparian and wetland vegetation starts to dry out and dies. And not only do we lose water on the landscape, but these rivers start to downcut 
and they lose elevation, increasing erosion and the amount of sediment moving through all of these systems. One major problem with this is we have reduced, reduced drought resilience. If a major drought comes through and there's lots of beaver present, we might have some negative effects, of course, but without any beaver, if a drought comes through, we're gonna have much larger negative effects and we're gonna have much less water on the landscape. So knowing that the beaver were gone, but we wanna to try to get them back, there were a lot of people that cared deeply for beaver and wanted to put a significant effort into bringing beaver back in the landscape. Gray Owl is a great story. He lived in Saskatchewan in Canada and he lived with beaver. He raised them from a young age. They lived in his house. And it was people like this who recognized how beaver were more than just a, you know, an animal that lived in water, but they had an incredible impact on the landscape. And so a significant effort was made to allow beaver populations to come back. In fact, we even started dropping beaver out of airplanes, parachuting them out down into the wildlands of the West, um, especially in the mountains of Idaho. There was one beaver in particular that they would drop over and over again as they tested this method to make sure that the beavers would live and the boxes upon landing would open up so the beaver could crawl out and make a new home. We have no idea how many beaver died or lived in this effort, but we know that many beaver did live and the beavers started to return to areas that it seemed they might never return to if we didn't help them. Even today, we continue to do beaver reintroductions across the landscape. Not only did we notice that beaver have a really positive impact on the land in terms of water, but we also realized that beaver left an incredible legacy in the, in, in the form of sediment that they collected in these glaciated alluvial valleys. Normally, a glaciated valley will have a V shape to it as that glacier cut down and then melted away. But we find that in valleys and watersheds that have beaver occupation over geologic time spans, we see that these valley bottoms will be flat and full of sediment. The sediment is excellent sediment for farming, high quality. And so this was an incredible gift to especially the Europeans that came and wanted to start building farms and using the land. So, Beavers, before we showed up, before the Europeans showed up, I should say, were managing and shaping these watersheds over many, many years, collecting all of this sediment that we turned into farmland. And you can see all of this material in here. This is all beaver complex, dams, wetlands. All of this is modified by beaver. They push the water out towards the valley walls. So not only did we remove the beaver, but we also then used all of that land that they transformed and turned it into farmland. The Willamette Valley was, in, was incredibly populated by beaver. That's why they chose the beaver as the state animal for Oregon because it's the perfect environment for beaver. It's flat. There's a lot of water. And they turned the they helped turn the Willamette Valley into an oak woodland oak savanna um, with the assistance of the indigenous cultures that lived here through prescribed burning. So the Willamette Valley has changed dramatically from what it was to what it is now. Instead of a multi-threaded river system on the top, we have a single-threaded river running through the valley. And uh, most of it is, has been converted to farmland. So that legacy that beavers left, we didn't really appreciate because we kind of started to think of beaver as a nuisance once they started to come back. But we sure did appreciate all of the work they did collecting sediment in those wetlands and in those wet valleys. But like I said, beaver have come back now. 
they're at much lower numbers, but when they do come, when, now that they've come back, they're starting to transform these river systems once again, as they modify them, building dams. And in doing so often, we do view them as a nuisance and we will remove beaver often, but that mentality is starting to change because now we realize that their role in, a, in wetland ecosystems and watershed ecosystems is as a keystone species. So they build habitat not only for themselves, but for an incredible amount of other species. And we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit here. I, I wanted to just um, go over a couple beaver myths that are out there. Um, you know, one of them I, I get asked often is, well, beavers, they, they always live in streams, right? And um, what do you guys think? Do you think beaver only live in streams? Well, they do live in streams, but they also live in a lot of different environments. As long as there's water and vegetation, they will colonize those areas. So they live in ponds and lakes, and um, they've even been found in oceans and intertidal rivers and glacial outwash systems. So they're incredibly adaptable and live in lots of different places. People ask if beaver eat fish. Well, fish, there are a lot of fish in beaver ponds, actually, because fish and beaver love to coexist together, but beaver do not eat fish. They are just herbivores and they only eat plants. Uh, but salmon and other fish love to live in beaver ponds because there's lots of food to eat. They're slow water habitat, so they can grow very large. And um, yeah, so beaver and fish get along really well. What about dams? Beavers always build dams, right? Well, that's not true either. Sometimes beaver just hang out, they live in burrows and they eat vegetation, but they don't always build dams. They only build dams if they have to. Well, so beavers are back. They're a good thing on the landscape. Let's try to understand why. Let's see what beaver do in watershed ecosystems. As I mentioned, beaver are a keystone species. They're also really special because they're not only just a keystone species, they're an ecosystem engineer. So in trying to make a habitat for themselves, they'll modify the physical and biological processes of a watershed. And that habitat that has been modified for them is also modified and better for an incredible amount of other species. So if there are a lot of beaver on the landscape, there's more biodiversity. If you remove beaver from the landscape, you also lose that biodiversity because those other animals need beaver present in order for them to be there as well. So when we talk about a beaver colony, that's just one family. If you go out to a stream and you see a series of beaver dams, that's probably one family of beaver that live there and maintain all of those structures. There can be as many as one to 10 beavers in a family, but usually an average of about six. And that compromises, or that's comprised of typically the two adult breeding pair, kits of the year, and then one-year-old beavers, because after two years of age, beavers leave the family unit in search of habitat to colonize and call their own. As a rodent, beaver are really unique in that they need two years to learn how to survive as an adult beaver. They need that much time because they have to build structures, assess the landscape, know what to eat, so they have to learn a lot of different behaviors and construction methods in order to be able to survive in all of those different habitats across North America. Beaver have a scaly tail that they use to help swim on the landscape. They don't use that tail to pat mud down on any of their structures, but they do use their very dexterous forelimbs to pack mud into structures and carry things across the landscape. They're very strong. And as rodents, they have sharp incisors or teeth, front teeth, that grow continually for their entire life. 
Because of that, they need to always chew on wood and other hard things in order to keep those teeth sharp and short. Otherwise, they could grow so long that they might not be able to eat very well. So they always have to chew, which makes people mad sometimes because it looks like they're just killing trees, but it's for a reason. They, they have to keep chewing and they use those trees for food and construction materials. So they recycle in a sense. Beaver diet, their, their diet is, they're herbivores, so they only eat vegetation, but it adjusts seasonally. So during the summer months, they eat primarily herbaceous vegetation, leaves and grass and forbs and rhizomes of water lilies. Then during the winter months, they will switch to primarily a woody diet. Now they don't actually eat the wood of sticks, they're actually just eating the bark or the cambium layer of the trees because that has the most nutrition in it. Their favorite species of tree by far are trembling aspen or willow or cottonwood, so populus and salic species. They're considered choosy generalist herbivores, which means that they take their favorite species first and then they switch to the less desirable food resources. They do this um, as it they, it's considered a central point foraging strategy. And that's what you can see here. They radiate out from their pond as they look for food and construction resources. They also dig these canals that you see radiating out from the pond. And they, they dig a lot. These canals will fill with water and they'll use that to float their resources back to the pond. Also to stay in the water as long as possible while searching for food resources farther and farther away from the pond. This was researched by Hood and Bailey at the bottom and they were investigating how beaver increased the connectivity on the landscape. And I think it's fascinating to see how many canals they have radiating out from the beaver ponds. Kind of looks like a neuron or with these axions and dendrites sticking out from them. It, it's really fascinating. And you can see here that this beaver has removed the bark from that stick because um, he's trying to just eat the cambium layer. Once they get the food back to the center of the pond, they will often create a food catch. Beaver do not hibernate during the winter, so they have to have food to eat all winter long. In northern areas where the ponds freeze during the winter, if they do not develop a large enough food cache to last all winter, they could starve. So it's very important to build this food cache that they access all winter long. As I mentioned, beaver aren't just eating this, these resources, but they're also using them to build structures that they live in and that they use to impound water. Beavers live in three types of homes or lodges. The most um, common or well-known is the water lodge or a lodge that is completely surrounded by water. These can be very large. They're made of mud and sticks and rocks and leaves. And they have multiple entrances that are always submerged under the water. So to get inside of their home, they have to swim under the water first. Second type of lodge they, that they construct is a bank lodge. This is just like a water lodge. It's made of the same material, but it's on the bank of a lake, pond, or a river. And these, they can grow larger over time by continuing to add sticks on top and digging out the inside so they can make a nice little warm nest chamber. And then the third type is a bank den, which is simply just a burrow in the bank of a pond, lake, or river. The common thing about all of their lodges is that their entrances are always submerged under the water. Otherwise, predators could get inside and access the beaver. This is where they live during the winter, and this is where the kits are born and grow up. Um, and as soon as the water level drops, they will abandon these lodges. So that is one primary reason why beaver build Dams. Dams are made of the same thing as lodges, sticks and mud and leaves and rocks, and they can be very large, they can be small, and they build many lodges throughout a colony. But like I mentioned earlier, sometimes they don't build any dams. It depends on what their 
environment is like and what they need. They build dams to maintain their water levels to keep their burrows submerged, but they also build dams to create deep enough water to avoid predation, um, to keep their ponds from freezing during the winter so that they can float material across the landscape instead of dragging it because they're cutting down large trees and, and accessing really large branches. That's very heavy, so they'd rather float it back. By building the dams on the landscape, they are dramatically modifying their habitat because they're flooding the upland with water, which completely changes the entire river system. When beaver colonize and build multiple dams, they increase wetland area and riparian area, and they make a beautiful mess. It's very, it can be complex, they can have varying ages, but this is one way that beaver increase the resilience and function of river systems is by increasing complexity, making this beautiful mess. They actually make healthier rivers. The water is cleaner, there's less sediment moving through there, and this is preferred habitat for many other species. Beaver will colonize an area and they'll start to build dams and harvest the, the food resources. But if they run out of material, they will abandon that site and move on. And this cycle of colon, uh, colonization and abandonment over geologic timescales has been posited as the beaver meadow formation theory. This theory basically goes like this. Beavers show up where there's a river the river is, uh, has an impact on the groundwater and there's lots of trees and they colonize it. They cut down some of the trees, they build dams and they start to pond water. That water increases the amount of water on the surface, but also in the groundwater. And right away, those ponds and dams start to collect sediment in the bottom. They continue to harvest the trees and the vegetation in this area, building more dams, ponding more water, collecting more sediment and raising the local water tables, increasing aquifer recharge in that area. When they run out of material, they will abandon the site, at which point the dams may breach, but they still will hold some water and continue to collect sediment. The groundwater won't be as impacted as much, but there's still more groundwater present here than there was with no beaver. Over time, the vegetation will come back and beaver might return and recolonize this site and start the cycle over again. The difference is that their ponds will be on top of this sediment. So over long time scales, they actually collect sediment in these systems and raise the elevation of the valley bottom. That is the sediment that makes wonderful farmland um, if we wanted to stop the beavers from living there and start farming that area. So overall, beaver impact the hydrology of watersheds. They expand the aquatic habitat and increase complexity of an area. They create and maintain wetlands. They clean the water. They increase drought resistance so there's more water on the landscape that slowly drains over time. And when large floods come through, they're not quite as large because those dams slow down that water as it moves through the watershed. They also impact the geomorphology of landscapes or they, they impact the way sediment is moving through our rivers. They collect sediment in dams, but they also dig sediment and move it around. They build with sediment. So they mobilize some sediment and move it on the landscape. And they also retain a lot of sediment that normally would just rush through the river system. Beaver are great for the hydrology. They clean water. They are great for sediment. And as I mentioned, they're a keystone species. So they help a lot of other different animals. When beaver are taken off of the landscape, all of these animals leave as well. 
So it's really important to have as many beaver on the landscape as, as we can accept or allow because then we are going to raise the biodiversity of plants and other animals. And beavers create positive feedback loops in terms of sediment accumulation, but also in terms of beaver population numbers. As more beavers come and transform the land, they make it um, more desirable for other beavers to come and use that land. So the, as more beavers show up and build more dams, all of a sudden we have more available land for beavers to colonize. And so there can be more and more beaver numbers. The amount of species that live in beaver ponds and in beaver habitat is amazing. There are so many species that depend on beaver. The more beaver you have, the more waterfowl in the landscape. Songbirds and woodpeckers love to live in beaver habitat. Reptiles and amphibians want to live in beaver ponds. Aquatic insects uh, love to live in beaver ponds. And when you have a lot of aquatic insects, you can have uh, more mammals, but especially more fish. Salmon really rely on these aquatic insects as food. And beaver not only help all of these animals, but they also improve the land for us. We have cleaner water. We can learn about trophic cascades and what a keystone species means. Um, so beaver are beneficial to us and other animals in so many different ways ways. That's why it's important for us to try to coexist with beaver. Sometimes if a beaver shows up and your shed is getting flooded, you know, that's a problem. And maybe the beaver can't stay there. But if we can learn more about beaver and learn about what they do on the landscape and start to expect the changes they might make, then we can find ways to live together. And there's a lot of tools you can use to stop all of those negative impacts from beaver, like chewing on your favorite vegetation, cutting down trees, or flooding your property or your crops. You can put up fencing or flexible pond levelers or culvert protectors. And I'm just gonna show these very quickly because they're really useful. Um, fencing works very well. If you put up fencing, Beaver aren't going to be able to get to these trees and chew them down. Some people use abrasive paints as well, and, and that has shown some success, but fencing works every time. Culverts, uh, beaver love to plug culverts because they can just make a small dam and create a really large pond. So you can put fencing behind culverts so that roads don't get flooded out. And for ponds, we can put in flexible pond levelers. I put in uh, many of these devices. They're not very expensive and they, they work almost every time. What these allow is um, they basically put a hole in the dam and the beaver can't figure out how to plug it. So we can prevent the pond elevation from ever getting higher than whatever point we wanna set. So we can keep the pond and the beaver, which, the pond is what provides all of those ecosystem services that we really like and want more of. Um, and the pond leveler will stop our shed from getting flooded. And uh, the beaver cannot figure out why his pond doesn't get any deeper, but as long as there's about three feet of water, he will, or he or she, they will stay. If the pond is too shallow, they might decide, decide to leave. So you usually need about three feet of water. And you can also use these pond levelers in combination with culvert protective fencing. In the end, I feel that the story of beaver in North America is a big part of our heritage and our legacy. We moved west looking for beaver. We removed the beaver, but then helped them come back. And they're back now. 
And as we learn about beaver more, we realize that they can be so beneficial to biodiversity. They can help with climate change and the negative impacts of climate change. They can help us with drought resilience, which is a big problem these days. There's more information coming out about forest fire and the impact beavers may have in keeping the soil wet and having forest fires be less impactful than if no beaver were present. We are now figuring out how to partner with beaver and restore degraded river systems. Beaver are also back in urban areas and cities, and it's an incredible educational tool to be able to be close to where beaver are, to see them do their work, to have kids grow up knowing about beaver, being able to see them. And we are healthier, not only from the impacts they have to the water and the watersheds, but simply having more green spaces around us can actually make us happier and healthier. So beaver have a incredible legacy that they've started and they are now continuing to grow that legacy. And we have the option to be a part of that. And uh, I think that's a really cool thing. So thank you so much for listening. Here are some beaver resources in case anybody's interested. If you have beaver on your property and you want to figure out ways to keep them there or maybe move them to a safe spot, um, these are some outfits that can help with that. I also have a list of some literature that I used for this presentation. Let me know if you're interested and I can pass that to you. Otherwise, I'll leave it here and thank you so much. Uh, I can take some questions. Yeah, thank you, Greg. That's that's awesome. I know we definitely have some fencing around our culverts at Columbia Springs because there are some beaver in our in our lakes there, and it it does work. <laughs> so, good suggestions. It's a lot better than having to rip out all that material every single day after they keep coming back and putting it in there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And what a great way to coexist too, and still have them on our land. Um, yeah. So I think we have a few questions in the Q&A here, um, but that I'm not able to see them actually. So Greg, if you want to pick your favorites, um, I'm sure people yes. would love to have their questions answered. Okay, let's see. I got them here. I see three. Let's start at the top. Um, what has been your favorite beaver interaction? Wow, there's been a lot. One time uh, we released these uh, this beaver in a pond and it had been housed in this facility for a long time. And when we released it, you know, it, it seemed very happy, but it was so used to humans that when we would come back to check on it, she would come out of the pond and sit right on the shore, right by us, and wasn't afraid and let, her, let us check her out. So that was really amazing because we, we got to release her. She wasn't killed like a lot of beaver are. And we got to see her kind of improve that area and hopefully be happy and like that spot. So that was really incredible. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Ashley Smithers. Are beavers and turtles friends? <laughs> oh, Ashley, beavers and turtles are the best of friends, actually. Um, you know, turtles love to live in ponds because it's slow water. There's lots of logs in there that they can bask on. Um, they can escape from predators in ponds. Turtles don't want to live in fast river systems. And beavers build dams which slow down the water. So they create the slow water habitat that turtles want to live in. So yes, beavers and turtles are really great friends and have been for a long time. That's a great question, actually. We have another one here. Are our farming options dwindling now that beaver are being more controlled by us and not creating the same habitat. Um, let's see, that's a good question. So really, I don't think beaver are impacting our ability 
Sorry, there's a train going by. I don't know if you can hear that, but our beaver aren't negatively impacting our ability to farm on the landscape. If anything, they increase our ability to farm on the landscape. Um, and, you know, we are learning how to live with beaver and controlling them more. But really, we have aerated almost all of the available farmland in the United States. Um, and it has been that way for a long time. So now that beaver are coming back, it's not just their habitat that we're thinking about protecting, but also we're realizing if we can protect any of the wetland that is left, we should do that because there's so few wetlands left on the landscape. So I think our farming options are dwindling, but it's not really from the impact of beaver, it's mainly from us already taking all of the available farmland on the landscape. But you know, it's, I think with beaver and coexistence and farming, often farmers and ranchers and beavers kind of were enemies. However, I love sitting around a table with people who kind of have a negative view of beavers and we start to just talk about what they do and how they can help us. And usually they're kind of skeptical, but over time, it's amazing to watch the transition that happens. And when we're able to listen to each other and talk, we can often find that goals and ideas we had that we thought were in conflict are actually really similar. And so I've seen ranchers and farmers say, I'm never gonna have beaver on our land. And all of a sudden they're saying, I can't believe what the beaver are doing and, I, and I'm getting extra you know, hay crops every year that I've never had before. And so I want more beaver to come on my land. Oh, we have another question here. How big can beavers get? Um, beavers can grow very large, actually. They have been, uh, I've, I've seen weights of up to 90 pounds. Um, they don't always look really big at first, because they're so round, but they have massive skeletons. They have a lot of fat and muscle on their bodies. So they're actually very large and they're strong and have sharp teeth. So they are territory defense holders and they've been known to fight each other. They will fight each other to the death. And very few instances of beaver harming or killing a human, it's, it's very rare. It often never happens, but it's because beaver are very docile. They don't want to be around humans. But since they are large, you have to be careful around beaver because they're very strong and those teeth are very sharp. Uh, where do those 90 pound beavers live? Yeah, um, that, you know, that's a good question. It depends on the environment. If there's lots of food and they can live to be very old, they'll continue to grow throughout their life's, lifetime and they can get very large. So the largest weights that I have seen came out of the Midwest and closer to the East Coast. I think it was like in Missouri or something like that. But also in Canada, there are incredible numbers of beaver in Canada and there's not very many human impact. So they can be free to live and, and grow. And there are there have been been known to be very, very large beaver, beaver in the wild lands of Canada. Um, so it really depends on where they are and how old they can live and how much food there is to eat. Here's another question. Are beaver the answer to salmon habitat and population restoration? Ooh, this is a really good question because, and a lot of people have been asking this. We spend billions of dollars on salmon restoration um, over, over time, you know, millions and millions of dollars a year. And the data that is coming in shows that where there are beaver and beaver modifications, there often are more salmon. It was thought for a while that beaver dams actually will 
keep salmon from being able to move up and down river systems. And we would rip out beaver dams uh, in the name of salmon migration and ability to move. But salmon, when they come into our river systems, they need a place to spawn. And after they spawn, those, uh, those young salmon, they will rear in that freshwater system. Like turtles, they don't want to spend most of their time in fast water. They want to live in slow water habitats. So a beaver pond is slow, it's deep, it's full of bugs, it's exactly where salmon want to rear. And the larger salmon can get before they go to the ocean, the lower their mortality rate or the, the more salmon live once they get to the ocean and become a breeding adult. And before we came and started messing with things, we had the highest numbers of beaver and we also had the highest number of salmon. So beaver and salmon have been living together and, and um, coexisting for tens of thousands of years. And you know they were getting along just fine without us. So I truly believe that if you want to use the most cost-effective form of salmon habitat restoration, you have to include beavers in that plan in some way. They're not gonna be right everywhere, but they can have a large impact on salmon populations. And the data that is coming in now is backing that up. All right, I think that was the last question. Yeah, awesome, there thank you, are. Greg. Give everybody a second here. Get in a last question if they want to. <laughs> but that's so interesting to hear about the salmon and the beaver working together because we do so much salmon work at Columbia Springs with our hatcheries. Um, but a lot of the problems are really just in that habitat. So sounds like there is hope. Yeah, beavers create wetlands and that's where salmon want to rear and they, um, you know, they keep invasive fish from moving up into the streams that might compete with the salmon. And they seem to cool down streams and temperature is a big problem for salmon. So it's not just the habitat, but it's also, they affect the temperature in a positive way for salmon. So it looks really positive. Yeah, definitely. Well, all right, I guess it's getting late here. So I'll let you get to the rest of your evening, Greg. And thank you everybody that was here joining us tonight. We hope to see you next Thursday at 5.30.